Okay, uh, just a quick note before we start. Um, if you take a look at your notes, I mistakenly put a 2 here, which is wrong. It should be a 1, because you want, it to, you want to make sure that it's random between 0 and 1. I put a 2 there by accident. Make sure you change that to a 1. And then, explicitly, when you talk about the output for, for particle swarm optimization, what you're doing is once you finally break the loop, you want to provide the best cost value and the best set of parameters that ensure that this loop broke. So the output would be whatever position and whatever cost made the loop stop, that's what you output. I just want to make that explicitly clear. Okay. All right, so we're going to get on to the last topic, which I think is pretty cool. It's uh, ant colony optimization. So it was proposed by an Italian scientist by the name of Marco Durigo in 1992. And uh, ant colony optimization is actually not typically used in machine learning. It's actually used in a variety of other applications, such as routing and scheduling problems. For example, if you want, if you have a bunch of uh, router, you have a bunch of routers that are placed in some sort of common area, what would be the best optimal placement for those routers to have the most coverage in terms of uh, in terms of uh, networking? And then it's also used in optimization problems as well. So we're, it's not typically used in machine learning, but you can if you make some modifications. But I want to I want to cover this because it's a pretty cool algorithm and it's an intelligent system. Which is actually, what this course is called. Okay, so we're going to cover and call the optimization uh, as the last topic in this course. Okay, so what ant colony optimization is, is that it's inspired by how ants behave in a colony when you're trying to search for food. Okay, that's why it's called ant colony optimization, because you're modeling it based on that. So it's inspired by ants, so I'm not inspired, it's inspired by uh, the behavior of ants. When uh, searching for food, for their colony. So ants, you know, ants have uh, a colony that they report to, but they're pretty self-autonomous, you know, they're self-autonomous on their own, okay? And the thing that's cool about ant colony optimization is that it's able to adapt to dynamic environments. So if the environment were to change suddenly, then the ants have instinctual behavior to change their behavior to adapt to the environment, okay? So it's, uh, let's see here, has the ability to, actually let me go full screen so we can see everything. Has the ability to uh, adapt to dynamic environments. Okay, like if the environment were to suddenly change, then the algorithm will be able to adapt in order to be successful. Okay, so when ants search for food, they use a very basic set of rules, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And these rules not only make sure that they're self-organizing, but they're able to communicate with other ants in the colony in order to achieve a common goal. So they communicate with each other, and they're also self-organizing. They can pretty much work by themselves. Okay, so uh, these, let me see here. When ants search for food, okay, and I'll talk about how this is, this applies to optimization a little bit, but I want to talk about this in terms of the biological aspect of them. You can take the biological aspect and abstract this to more uh, into to terms that we understand, and then we can go back and forth and figure out, you know, they actually, there's actually a correlation between what we know and this. So they use a basic set of rules. Uh, right, they use a basic set of rules. And then these rules, Um, allow ants to communicate with each other and cooperatively this is important and co they cooperatively uh, optimize their paths to food sources Okay. All right. So the basic premise, like I'm, I'm really going on a limb here, but it's, it's very basic. There's obviously some variation to find this, but when ants search for food, what happens is that let's say you know you've got a bunch of paths that the ants traverse. Every time a ant goes through a particular path, they leave what are known as pheromones. They're pheromone trails, and pheromones are a volatile chemical substance that ants are very attracted to. So the higher the concentration of pheromones 
the more likely that ant is attracted to those particular pheromones, and the more likely they will venture down a particular route. So if you have a whole bunch of paths, and you know there's a bunch of paths, and there's some random element, or there's some choice that each of you know that there's some element of choice that the ant can choose if you if you're presented with a bunch of random paths. If one path has a strong dominant pheromone scent, then the ant will most likely go down that path with the strongest pheromones. So the more pheromones that are along the particular path, the more likely more ants have traveled along this path, and the more likely at the end of the path there will be some sort of food source that the ants are trying to accumulate. Okay, so the pheromones and the pheromones are the basic communication unit that the ants use to communicate with each other to try to find food. All right. So when Ants search for food, right? They leave what are known as pheromone trails. Okay, pheromone trails, that's the uh, key word here. Okay, so pheromones are a chemical substance Uh, that ants are attracted to. Okay, so it's the scent of the pheromones that they like. So it's the scent attracted to the scent. Okay, so pheromones allow ants to communicate with each other, and if they, you know, so to let them, to let other ants know that a food source has been found. Okay, so ants use pheromones. To communicate with each other. Um, to signify that a food source has been found. Okay, that's good. Okay, so. Uh, as ants traverse along these multiple paths, if one path has a very strong odor of pheromones, the more likely that ants will travel down that particular road, okay, or that particular path. Okay, so the stronger the scent, the more likely the more likely that ants have traveled along this trail. Okay, so there's a higher chance that food is located at the end. Okay, so there's a higher chance that food is at the end. That's their ultimate goal. They want to get the food and then, you know, go back to the colony and they go back and forth and back and forth until the food's exhausted. Okay, so without pheromones, I'd like to point out that if there are no pheromones to begin with, if the place is initially unexplored, then the ants are completely random because they don't have any pheromones to guide them. So basically, at the very beginning, when you're trying to search for food, the behavior is completely random. As you start iterating through and as the ants start to travel around, you'll build pheromone trails and eventually you'll get the ants to be in an organized behavior that go from one path to another to the food source. All right? So without pheromones, the ants' behavior is random. Yeah, because they're attracted to the scent, so if there's no scent to guide them, then they, uh, you know, their their behavior is completely random. Okay, so with these different paths that ants can take, there is a sense of randomness. So even though you have one path that has a very high concentration of pheromones, not all ants will want to take the same route. They have there's an element of randomness where, you know, there's uh, you know Robert you know Robert Frost, the road not you know the road less traveled. Some ants may want to opt to choose the route that was not traveled to begin with. So a lot of a lot of ants with high probability will take the ant and will take the path that where a lot of pheromones are. But some ants may want to venture off and go to a path that is less traveled. Okay, and that's the reason why the, this is so dynamic. It's because there's a there's a randomness element to it. So not ants not all ants will travel down the same path. Some ants will go down other paths that are less traveled. And it's nice if you want to locate more food. Okay. So however. Ants don't always 
take the path with the strongest scent. Okay, so they may choose a different path depending on the well, sense, you know, depending on the strength of the scent. So they may take a different path uh, depending on the on the scent strength and a bunch of other factors. But it's predominantly the scent of the you know the strength of the scent. Okay, they may also. You know, choose a different path. You know, choose, not choose a random path. If there is no scent. So they'll just choose one at random, roll the dice, and there we go. So this correlates with the fact that with no pheromones. Okay? So this, you know, there's some randomness associated to which path the ant takes. Okay. So on average, though, with high probability, the path with the strongest scent is the path that will most likely be traversed, you know, be traversed on given a particular ant. Okay. So there is some randomness uh, to which path an ant takes. Okay. So on average, the stronger the scent that is down this path, the more likely that ant will go along this path. So this is a probabilistic uh, algorithm. It's a randomized, randomized and also probabilistic. It's based on probabilities. Okay? So on average, the stronger the scent, the more likely that ant, the more likely an ant will traverse down this path. Okay. All right. So w the thing with pheromones is that they eventually fade over time, right? So when you have some sort of food source and you have these ants that are going back and forth along a path, eventually when the food source depletes, right, there will be no ants that traverse along this path, and pheromones will actually fade over time. So if, actually, if no ants actually go along this path and reinforce the pheromones, eventually the pheromones will actually die over time, and in that case, that pheromone scent will eventually fade which means that the ants will no longer be attracted to that particular path. So the strength of your pheromones will actually be indicative of how much food is at the source. And eventually when the source depletes, that path will no longer be taken, the pheromones die off, which means that you most likely won't go along that path anymore because all the food is gone. So that's why you want to traverse through other paths. So you're basically following pheromones to food sources, and if that food source is depleted, the pheromones along, the pheromones along that path will fade, which means that you probably shouldn't take that path anymore. That's why it's dynamic. So it actually, it, you know, it actually adapts to what is currently available in the environment. If there's no food, go somewhere else. All right? <clears throat> so uh, over time, pheromones, uh, let's see here, pheromone trails will evaporate if not reinforced by ants. It makes sense, right? Because as ants are going along this path, they keep dropping pheromones. So there's a constant drop of pheromones. If no ants go along this path anymore, then there's no pheromone deposits, which means that no ants have traveled, which probably means that you shouldn't go along that path anymore. But some ants will try because of, you know, because of the randomness. Right? So over time, pheromone trails will evaporate if not reinforced by ants. Okay? And then what will happen is if paths that lead us to a depleted food source uh, you know if paths that lead us to a if, if there are paths sorry if there are paths sorry I'm grammar's off today if there are paths that lead us to a depleted food source uh, over time the pheromones will fade as no ants will go along this path, or very few if these paths. OK? 
Okay? So the scent disappears. The scent disappears. And the reason why this is good is because it allows you, allows the ants to find new food sources. Which makes sense, right? Okay. So you can think of pheromone trails as a distributed, dynamic, and collective memory. So you can think of it as a database of the most popular trails that the ants should progress through, and you distribute that memory or distribute those facts along the colony. So it's a, it's a distributed memory that is communicated along all the ants, which is actually a pretty cool thing. All right, so pheromone trails. are uh, what's known as distributed, dynamic, and collective memory. So it's pretty much a database of the most current popular, tra uh, popular trails to go at a certain time. And this database continually keeps updating as food sources deplete and as, food, as new food sources are found. Right? So it's a database of the most uh, recent searches for food. Uh, I don't know uh, of ants in the same colony. Okay, so enough gibberish. Let's actually do an actual graphical example. It's actually nice to put this into pictures, which will actually explain the algorithm a little better. So here's a graphical example. I pulled this off of a website by a guy named Lee Jacobson. It's actually a really cool website. It's called uh, Ant Colony Optimization for Hackers. So it's actually a nice summary that talks about ant colony optimization and actually puts this stuff into code. And you can actually see it working, uh, working nice in a JavaScript uh, application. So I'll put a link up on, uh, on our detail course. You can actually explore that for yourself. So this is Lee Jacobson, and this is a graphical example. Okay. So let's say currently this is this is the, uh, the you know we've got one of you know we've got some uh, ant behavior going on here and currently the pat you know the ants are going along this particular path right there's a large strong pheromone scent and the pat you know this path is what is traversed by the ants but we can certainly see that this is not the shortest path there's certainly another path that will get us to the food in a much quicker way which is this path over here. Right? So remember, there is randomness associated with the ants. So over time, there might be a couple of ants that will actually go along this path instead. So not all the ants are going to go along you know, the strongest pheromone scent. Now, some of them will probably go along this path. All right? And notice that this path is shorter. So as ants start to get this food and come back, you'll see that the amount of time it takes to go to and back is much shorter than the amount of time it takes to go above. So as ants start going through here, the number of pheromone deposits will be doubled. The throughput will be increased because by the time one ant goes along the top path back to the colony, more ants will have gotten more food along the bottom path. So more pheromones will be deposited on the bottom than along the top. Then eventually what's going to happen is that you'll have a stronger pheromone scent along the bottom, which means that over time the top path will no longer be taken because the bottom path has a stronger pheromone scent because you are depositing more pheromones along the shorter path because you're depositing more pheromones at a faster rate than the top would. Then eventually what's going to happen is that the top will no longer be taken or very few will take it and the bottom one will be taken instead. So that's why it's actually quite dynamic. So suppose we have the following scenario. Okay, so this path here uh, in red will be the path that the ants are currently taking. Okay, so ants are currently taking a longer path for food. Okay, so that, that's currently what is happening. Let's say that's, you know, initially this is what happened. Okay, so we can see that this is the most optimal path. We can see that the shorter one is probably the better path to take to get food you know it's always food you know the straightest or the, the shortest path is a straight line right so we can see that this isn't the most optimal path there's obviously another path that you can take that will get your food faster that isn't the most optimal path okay 
remember that ants exhibit random behavior. So just because all these ants go along this particular path doesn't mean that that ant's gonna go along that path. On average, it certainly will, but there's a randomness associated with ants where it may wanna take the road less traveled instead, all right? So remember that ants have random behavior, okay? They can choose whatever path they want. They don't have to go with the majority. Some, you know, some ants might want, want to support the underdog and support the underdog, right? So they can choose whichever path they want. Okay? So suppose some ants take the other path instead. So suppose some ants take the other path, take the shorter path. which I'll, you know, let's make this orange to make sure that we know what we're talking about. So this is orange here, so suppose some ants take the shorter path, okay? Then what's gonna eventually happen is that um, as more ants travel along this path, the amount of pheromone deposits will be at an increased rate in comparison to the pheromones that are along the top trail. And then eventually what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a shift in the paths. So because the path is shorter, right? When delivering food back to the colony, it will take less time than the other paths. Well, the other path, really. There's only two paths here. So this is a very simplified scenario. Obviously, there's more paths to deal with in a real world situation, but okay. So therefore, more pheromones get deposited along the shorter path faster than the longer path. So in terms of if you've taken any networking courses, you can think of this as throughput. There's a higher throughput of pheromones for the shorter path compared to the longer path, okay, than the longer one. So you can think of this as higher throughput, okay? So uh, what's gonna happen is that this scenario will start to happen. All right, so eventually you're gonna see here that you know more pheromones get deposited along the shorter path. So you'll see that some ants decide to take this route Okay, then eventually what's going to happen is that because there are more pheromones that are deposited along the lower path, it'll eventually converge to this scenario because more pheromones are being, being deposited along the shorter path, which means that there's a higher throughput. Eventually the pheromones are going to shift. The lower path is going to have a stronger pheromone deposit than the upper half because more pheromones are being deposited along the shorter path because there's a higher throughput. And eventually you're going to get this where not many ants will travel along this path anymore because you know, there's still randomness associated to it, but the majority of ants will go along the shorter path because there's a stronger pheromone scent along the shorter path, okay? So eventually, uh, the shorter path will become stronger and fewer ants take the longer path. There is gonna be some randomness associated to it, but on average, most of the ants are gonna go along the bottom path, okay? Because the pheromones are gonna fade, right? So pheromones for a longer path will fade. Right, because if not many ants travel along the longer path, then it's probably not a good idea to go along the longer path, but some, some ants will try to do it anyway. Okay, and eventually you get that. Okay, so therefore, the nice thing about this is that ants will eventually find the shortest path to something. So if you've taken any algorithms courses like ELE 428 or COE 428 or whatever, there's a problem which is called the shortest path. What is the shortest path to go from one point to another? If you extract that and put this into an ant colony optimization problem, you will eventually find the shortest path from one point to another, which is why this is actually a very nice algorithm to work with, because it finds the shortest path to, from one point to another. Okay, so ants, will generally find the shortest path to food. 
Okay? The shorter the path, the more dense the pheromones will be, which makes sense, right? The shorter the path, the more dense the pheromones, what we'll call these pheromone deposits are, which makes sense, right? The shorter the distance, the more, the more, uh, you know, the, the more traffic that the ants have to go back and forth, and there will be more likely that there will be higher deposits of pheromone along the paths, okay? So in general, what we can consider um, ant colony optimization problems is we can consider them to be what are known as graph problems. If you've taken any algorithms courses, you can consider a graph as having nodes and edges, where nodes would be particular states of the actual algorithm, and edges would define relationships between each of the states. Okay? So in general, I know uh, this is probably something you didn't want to see again, but I'm going to talk about it in a very you know, simple manner. That'll hopefully be a little f more fun in comparison to the other course that you took. So in general, and calling the optimization problems are ACO for short, or formulated as graph problems. Not graph like you're plotting stuff in a Cartesian plane. Graph in the sense that you have its you know, nodes and edges. Okay? So what I mean by graph, okay, uh, this would be, you know, graph, it consists of nodes and edges. Okay? So in this case, for nodes in ant colony optimization, you can think of a node in ACO as a particular state or a particular um, intermediate solution for, for the thing that we want to optimize. Okay? So <clears throat> a graph consists of nodes and edges, and then let's see here. So a node uh, is a state. Okay? And then each node um, is an intermediate, what's, what's known as an intermediate solution. So it's basically uh, piecing together some part of the actual solution until we finally get to the very end. Okay? So as you move to different nodes, what you're doing is that you are incrementally changing the solution from one state to another to accommodate for a better situation. Okay? So as we move between nodes, uh, a more complete intermediate solution is formed, right, is formed. Okay? So that is a node, and then edges define relationships between the nodes. So we have edges. And I'll give you a graphical example. I just want to define these. So edges, the, what they do is they allow the transition uh, from one state to another. Okay, so each edge indicates some sort of similarity or some sort of like distance measure between the two states. So it indicates um, how desirable it is to move between the two nodes. So it gives you some sort of desirability factor. Okay, this is also what's known as prior knowledge which I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so basically it looks like this. You have a bunch of circles here. I'm gonna call these our nodes, okay? And then there are edges that connect between the nodes. So you might have an edge here, an edge here, something like this, right? And that might connect to some other part, you know, it might connect to some other parts of the graph, okay? And then we have, you know, we've got a little ant here, I guess. Okay, so this will be a node. This is an edge. Okay, and this would be the current state. So wherever an ant is currently at would reflect the current state of the ant. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit. So this is the current state here. So at each node, okay, the ant, so what, what's happening here is actually before that, let me, let me get rid of this. So basically what's happening here in, in ant colony optimization, uh, what's happening is that each ant 
uh, can visit a node. Okay, to get to the food source. So this is what's happening here. And then what's happening uh, mathematically or you know systematically is at each node, uh, the ant stochastically, or randomly if you wish, stochastically chooses a path uh, to a new node. using two factors. Okay, so when you're taking a look at it, and if you wanted to traverse to a different node or a different state, it relies heavily on two factors, okay? The first factor is basically the cost or the fitness at the current node. Okay, so what I mean by this particularly is, you know, how well the particular ant is suitable for that particular node. So it's defined uh, locally in the current node. Okay, and then the second thing that it depends on are the actual pheromones themselves. So when you want to traverse to a different node or a different state of the actual, you know, the actual paths, you not only depend on what is seen currently at that particular state in time, but also the pheromone trails that are along the neighbors of that particular node. Okay, so pheromones are indicates uh, past ants knowledge. Okay, and uh, past ants will collective. It's collective knowledge, and it's also global. So in this case, what I mean here is that you have this particular state, and then you have a bunch of pheromone deposits. So these would be pheromones, I guess. Right? And then let's say we've got an edge over here, for example. So, so these here are pheromones, pheromone deposits. Okay? So the ant, when, it, when you want to go from one state to another, it not only depends on what is currently seen at the node, but all the pheromone trails that are along the neighbors of that current node. Okay, so that's fine. Okay. So what we can do now is we're going to go into a little bit of mathematics and then I'll talk about the algorithm uh, very briefly. And then I'll take a break and then we'll, do, we'll conclude the course. So I'm actually quite close to finishing here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we can define the... Remember, there's randomness associated with each of these ants. So we can define the probability that... The case ant, so there's a bunch of ants in our system. We defined that, you know, beforehand. And we're going to take a look at one individual ant, which is called the case ant. The, we can define the probability that this ant transitions from node I to node J as, so it's defined as P sub I J K. So this is the probability that the kth ant will want to go to node j, given that it's currently in node i, to be the following. So I've got a bunch of symbols here that I'll define very soon. This looks like gibberish, but let me write it out, and then I'll define each term individually as we go, okay? Okay, so what exactly does this mean? Ooh, doesn't look very nice, but we can talk about it as we go. Okay, so let's go to the next page and define these. So, tau ij, what this means is that it is the amount of pheromone deposits that are in between nodes i and j. Okay, so this is the amount of pheromones, pheromone deposits between nodes i and j. Okay, so this is the first term right here. Okay, the next term, eta ij, is what is known as the edge strength, or you know, it's the uh, prior knowledge or how likely that ant is going to go between i and j. The smaller the distance, the more likely the ant is going to go through. Right. So this is the, what's known as the edge strength for 
uh, or between nodes i and j. Okay, so that's the second term. Okay, and then we have, so this is this term here, and then we also have this term, ni sub k. And what this means, ni sub k, it's the neighboring nodes that surround node i for the kth ant. So this is saying it's the list of all nodes that ant k sees that are neighbors to i. So for example, if I had this graph, let's say you had, you know, one and two, some node here, like this, okay? Let's call this one, two, and three, right? And we'll call this, let's say, node four, for example, and this is the current state, okay? In this case, here, nik would represent one, two, and three. So there's nodes one, two, and three, for example. Okay, so in this case, if this is the current node, these are all its neighbors. So the edges indicate, you know, um, relationships between the nodes. So if I take a look at this node here, right? So the, let's see here, ni. So this would be node i. So instead of this, let's call this four. Sorry, this is node four. Okay, so the neighbors for node number four for the kth ant are basically one, two, and three. So it's the list of all nodes that are neighboring the particular node of interest that you're looking at. Okay, so n4 of k. So whatever ant that comes there, it could be the first one, second one, doesn't matter. Okay, so you have that. And then finally, you have two constants. We have alpha and beta. And these actually control the contribution that each of these terms make in order to, uh, in order to, you know, to define the actual final probability. So in this case, we have alpha, which is the uh, controls contribution to pheromones. Okay, and beta, this controls contribution, uh, not to, but of, I'm sorry. This is of uh, fitness. So you have all these constants, but then what does this actually mean over here? What does this mean? What does this mean? What this is saying is that you are collectively determining the sum of all of these products where each of the nodes are along the neighbors of i. So what this is saying here is that we sum up all of tau i l alpha and eta i l beta for all nodes l that are neighbors to node i. Okay, so that's what this is saying here. So, take, so for, for, for a particular node i, collect all the neighbors that are along i and then just take a look at what their pheromone deposits are along each of their paths as, long as, the edge, as well as the edge strengths along each of their paths, multiply them all together, sum them up, and you're done. Okay? So intuitively what's happening here is that we can split this up into a product of two terms. So this here, okay, this term here is the probability based on pheromone deposits. So this is the probability uh, based on pheromones. Okay. And finally, this guy here. So this part here, this is the probability based on cost or fitness. So this is cost or fitness. Okay. So that's the final probability that an ant would take node i to node j for some probability, you know, for, for some ant k. Okay. So once that's done, I have one more term and then I'll lay out the algorithm and then we'll take another break and then I'll conclude the course. Okay, so the edge strength, uh, you know, mu i j, is usually defined as the inverse distance. What's known as the inverse distance between nodes i and j. It makes sense, right? The smaller the distance, the larger the strength, the more likely those ants will want to go along that path because it's a shorter path, all right? So 
it's usually defined as 1 over drj. And this is the distance between nodes i and j. Distance, it depends on what problem domain you're looking at. Distance could be distance between cities in terms of kilometers, or it could be distance in feature space. It depends. But whatever distance measure you use, it should make sense for the application that you're trying to hone it for. OK? The smaller the distance, the more desirable it is to take this path. Because it's shorter, right? Okay. Okay? All right. Okay. That's done. So now we've got one final thing to look at. So uh, basically what happens is as the ants move between each of the nodes, what's going to happen is that the pheromone trails will have to be updated. So when one ant moves to another path or one ant traverses along you know, a path between two nodes, you're going to have to update the pheromones that each of the paths the ants traverses. Right? So we're going to have to do a pheromone update. So also remember that uh, the pheromones uh, of each path get updated. Well, instead of get, instead of get, well, they need to be updated. Okay, so each ant leaves a pheromone trail, right? So when one ant goes to another node in between two, you know, an ant between the two nodes, there is some a form of pheromone deposit that each ant leaves. So each ant leaves a pheromone deposit, I guess. You can call it deposit, sure. Okay, so we need, so as the ants traverse around this graph of nodes, what's going to happen is that we need to determine the amount of pheromones that the ants leave as they traverse along all the paths. So over time, we have to keep updating the pheromone paths to calculate how likely one ant is going to go down one path as we, as we deposit more pheromones, pheromones along the paths. Okay, so therefore we need to determine, uh, let's see, we need to determine uh, the amount of pheromones pheromones uh, each ant leaves along a path. Sir? Yep? If two nodes are exceptionally close to each other, wouldn't they end up uh, kind of dominating the probability? Yes, that's right. And so are we going to be using the way to solve that? Or? Well, it would be nice to, if, well, what you can do is you can perhaps group them into one node. Like if they're exceptionally close, you could replace it with one node altogether and they can all collectively move. But yeah, there are, there are certain post-processing techniques where if you have nodes that are very close, you would just merge them into one to, to prevent that clustering that you're talking about. So there's many different post-processing techniques. But yeah, that, that is one particular, that's one particular way to do it. But I don't know what exactly, maybe the distance is beyond some threshold, if it's less than like 0 0.01 or something, then you might want to make them to a super node and let all the ants collectively converge there, but it, de it depends on the scenario and it just, it just it's, it deals with experimentation, so. But yes, that, that is one possible scenario you can think of. Okay? All right. So, the new update, uh, let's see here, the new update for the, uh, let's say, pheromone trails are the following. So remember, tau i j is the amount of pheromones that are left between path i and j. So what's going to happen is that it is a summation of two terms. Let me just explain this in a little bit. Okay. So what this is saying here is this is the new, uh, I guess, new pheromone uh, strength, I guess, between nodes i and j. And what this is doing here is that this is simulating pheromone decay. So over time as the, you know, over time the pheromones will decay. So when you're doing one minus rho, where, you know, rho is going to be a number between zero and one, what you're doing is that you're taking the current pheromone deposits and decaying them over time. So this actually simulates pheromone decay. And then it's supplemented by this term, which is the total number of pheromone deposits that the ants have traveled if they were to traverse along this path between I and J. 
Okay, so what this is, is that this is the current total uh, pheromone, I guess strength, if you, if you want to call it that, decayed to simulate fading. Okay, and this is a constant between zero and one to ensure that we don't, you know, to ensure that it's, you know, it's less than one, so. Okay, zero to one. And what this term does here, this, um, it actually, it, this calculates the total number of, not total number, but total uh, deposits the all ants have made. if they go down this path. And I'll explain this mathematically in a little bit. So this term actually makes sense. So if you want to update the pheromone trail between node i and j, you take the current deposits, you decay them over time, and then you supplement them with all the pheromones that all of the ants have deposited along that path, should they travel along that path. And that's what the second term is for. Okay, so delta tau i, j, k. What this means is that this is the amount of pheromones uh, deposited between I and J, okay, from ant K. Okay, so that's what it is. So formally, let's define it over here. It's defined as the following. It's defined as, sorry, L sorry, not L, Q over LK if ant has traveled between I and J and zero otherwise. Okay, this constant Q is, a, is just a constant. You can set that to whatever you want. Some people typically set this to one. Okay, and this cost, L sub K, is the total cost or the, the amount of, you know, the, uh, the distance that the ant has traveled, um, you, know, uh, you know, to and from the original source, to and from, so there's a starting node and then the ending node is where the starting node will be, so this will be the total amount of distance the ant has traveled from start to finish, okay? So LK is the total distance the ant has traveled, ant K has traveled. Uh, you know, from start to finish. Usually it's just the sum of the distances. So usually just sum the distances. Okay, so I'm going to just lay out the algorithm and then uh, I'll give you, you know, yeah, I'll just lay out the algorithm and then uh, that's it. And then we'll, uh, we'll conclude. All right. So, Final algorithm is this. Okay, so there's a bunch of initializations that you have to do. Okay, so first off you have to select a bunch of parameters. So you need to set the value Q, you need to set the value of rho, there's alpha and beta as well that you have to control, and also the number of ants, which we'll call n. Okay. What you want to do is, given your particular problem, you want to establish, you know, nodes and edges and make your graph. So first off, you want to establish which relationships between, you know, nodes and edges you want to, you want to establish that. And I'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. So initially, and make graph, okay? The next step would be to initialize the pheromone trail. So once you create all your graph and all the edges, what you're going to do is for each edge that you have in your graph, you initialize the pheromone trails to be random. Usually they're very small. You don't make them zero, which means that you know, none of the ants are gonna go anywhere. So when you initialize the pheromone trails, you make them all of them relatively small so that you know, there is a chance that all the ants will take some path, okay? So initialize pheromone trails. Okay, uh, and they're usually you know, random. And this is tau i j, okay? Also, what you want to do is you want to make the edge weights 
what we call equiprobable. So what we mean by this is that the desirability to go along any of the edges is equally likely because we're starting out and we don't know anything about the cistern yet. So what we want to do is we want to make this 1 over, okay? So what this is saying here is that this is just the number of neighbors to node i. So what you're doing is you're indicating that it's equally likely to take any one of these edges. Just choose whichever one you want, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to place the n ants at random. So you're going to just put them in random positions in the graph and you don't care where they go, just random positions, okay? And then finally, we're going to repeat the following until we converge. So repeat until convergence. Okay. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to calculate all the path probabilities. So for every single ant that you have, you want to calculate all the probabilities that the ant will take between nodes i and j for all of the edges in your graph. Okay? So calculate uh, probabilities. I'm actually almost done. And I'll give you a practical scenario where this, where, you know, why this is used, and then we'll finish. So probability for each ant k. So calculate probabilities for each ant k. So what I mean by that is you want to calculate this guy right here. This is tau i j power alpha i j beta, and then divided by, you want to sum over all the weights. Uh, no, oh, not the weights, but the uh, neighbors that are incident upon node i. Okay, so you're going to calculate that, and you're going to do this for all nodes i. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. And then what you're going to do next is, given those probabilities, you're going to choose paths at random. So choose a path uh, to take for each ant. Okay, so the path should stop and start at the same location. So it should stop, path, stops, and starts at the same node. Because we're simulating a complete tour. So you have your start node, you have your food source. What you want to do is you want to go along, collect the food, and then come back. So you want to figure out that path that goes from start to the end and then end back to the beginning. So you're simulating collecting food. So at the same node. So you want to choose that particular, choose some sort of path at random, okay? And then what you're going to do after is you're going to update the pheromone trails. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to calculate this equation here with the decay that we have. And then you want to add up any of the deposits that any of the ants have left along each of the trails, each of the uh, paths. Okay, and then this would be L over, or Q over LK, sorry. Uh, if ant K takes path between I and J, okay, and zero otherwise. Okay, and then we finish. And then here, this would be for all uh, node paths, okay? Uh, for all nodes I, for all, yeah, that's fine. And then we finish, okay? And then conversions happens either when you exceed uh, maximum number of iterations or when the distance traveled between all the ants will most likely, it will relatively be the same. So if the majority of ants decide to, if they take this one path, which a lot of them will take, and the, the amount of distance that is traveled by most of the ants is relatively the same, then you know that you probably have a good solution, and that's when you stop. Okay? So convergence happens when, I'm almost done, when the distance traveled uh, distance traveled from start to finish. For most of the ants, doesn't change. Uh, or we exceed total number of iterations.
Okay. And that's the final algorithm. Okay, so I'm just going to show you one application, and then we're going to conclude the course. Well, I'll take a little break, like a five-minute break, just a breather, and then I'm going to conclude the course very, 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 um, very quickly. Okay, so here's an application of, uh, you know, here's, here's an application of uh, ant calling optimization. You may or may not have heard of this problem, but it's what's known as the traveling salesman problem. It's a problem that was designed by uh, Leonard Euler in the 1600s or 1700s, and basically you have some salesmen that wants that, there's a bunch of cities and there's a bunch of distances in between cities. And the goal of the traveling salesman is to figure out the least amount of distance to travel to visit all the cities once and come back to its starting point. So starting from some initial starting point, you visit each of the cities once and go back to where you started with the least amount of distance possible. Right, so that's what's known as a traveling salesman problem. So a traveling salesman problem. Okay, so um, let's see here. So you have given cities and, uh, you know, given cities represented as nodes. And edges that define the distances between the cities. Okay, find the shortest path. to visit all the cities only once and come back to the initial spot. And come back where you started. So this is definitely applicable. If you use ant colony optimization here, it's definitely applicable to use for this particular problem. So here's a particular scenario of the traveling salesman. So it might look something like this. Okay, you have 10 cities, right? You have 10 cities, and you have all these distances that can, or you have all these roads that connect between the cities. And your goal is given some initial starting point, you have to figure out the best way to go through all these cities with the least amount of distance traveled. Okay, so you have 10 cities, and then the edges are distances between cities. Okay? And then the goal is to find the best, best path with the shortest distance. So you can certainly use ant calling optimization for this, and I'll let your imagination figure that out. So there we go. Okay? All right. So I'm going to take a little break, uh, about five minutes, because I want to, I want to make a natural conclusion video that will be self-contained. And then we're going to finish up with the course. And then next week we'll do final exam stuff.